uh, this course examines, um, okay, I guess, uh, well, I'll read it. This, this course examines state and non-state actors in a dynamic global world. We focus on the formation of the liberal international order and various challenges to it. We're going to look at different case studies, and the course emphasizes weekly writing, student-led discussion, and cooperation in small groups. So I'm just going to kind of lay out the big picture for the class, okay? And if my English is going too fast, you know, raise your hand. If it's too slow, you can raise your hand. I'm trying to find the right balance. Now, two key concepts in our class is global governance and a liberal international order, okay? And by global governance, we mean that you know, governance is basically the process by which, we collectively, by which we collectively solve our problems. And the key idea is that you know, effective governance today requires multiple state and non-state actors, okay? That you know, one government cannot solve problems on its own. Uh, there's lots of examples. Uh, for example, like anyone from California? Who's from USA? Yay, okay, one person, okay. Where are you from? I'm actually from Oregon. From where? Oregon. Oh, Oregon, like uh, Portland? Yes. Okay, very nice say. Uh, oh, wow, we have people from all over, okay. Anyway, I'm from Los Angeles, right? Woohoo, so Cal. And then um, it's, a, it's a great place, great city, but we also have a very bad, like, like a gangpe, gang problem, okay? And then, um, and, it, and it used to be that, you know, if, like the police, you know, if you, you know, if you did something bad, they just put you in jail. And then if you're like an illegal immigrant, they just deport you, okay? But then the, the police later realized this is causing even bigger problems, okay? Because a lot of the people who were in gangs, who were deported, they were from Central America, okay? And then when you deport them to Central America, they form a new gang in Central America. And then, and then they come back across the border. And so basically you're just recycling them over and over again. And not only are you not preventing the gang problem in your own city, you're causing, you're exporting gang problems to other countries. And so the police realize that you know, we cannot solve you know, crime, we cannot solve gangs on our own, we need a partnership of the governments of these other places, such as Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. And we also need to work with civil society organizations because we need to encourage young people, young men, you know, not to commit crime, you know, to do other things. And so the police got smart and they had to work with other governments and also like, you know, what are some important civil society institutions that make an impact on young people? Things like what? Can anyone imagine? Like, what's important in your community? What's your name? Samira. Samira. Where are you from? Sweden. Oh, Sweden. Very nice place. Okay. And then, like, so what are some important institutions in Sweden for young people? <laughs> oh, okay. Mm. Okay, yeah, sports, football, okay. And also, I think anyone from Latin America, uh, also maybe like if you're from Latin America, maybe the Catholic Church or just churches in general. And so the idea is that we need to work with you know many different civil society organizations. You can't just you know put them in jail and you know, deport them. So that's example number one for good governance. Uh, number two is that you know there's been a lot of talk about you know security issues, ISIS, okay, and also health and also health. All right, that should be an H, not a tree. Okay, threats, like such as Ebola. Um, I want to talk about Ebola a little bit later, but I, um, and also another big issue here in Korea is like migration. Um, usually, people from poor countries they want to come to rich countries, uh, and then you know so we are getting up more and more migrants in South Korea from surrounding countries such as the Philippines. So they come to Korea, but sometimes they have a hard time adapting. Right? And government cannot help you all the time because you know usually there's a long line for government services, right? So when migrants come to Korea, you know, where where can they go to get some help? You know, to get information. 
Do they go to the Hanyang administration office? No, they're not that helpful. Okay, well maybe they are, but they're also very busy, right? Uh, so the factory workers that I know, uh, such as Jose from the Philippines, he goes to the International Churches of Christ. It's a big Christian group here in Seoul. And you know, he comes to Korea because wages are five times more than in the Philippines, but he also needs friends, right? And so by going to church, he can you know, adapt to life in Korea. Okay, so the bottom line is that you know, national governments today, whether it's US, Mexico, Korea, they need to work with a wide array of international organizations and subnational actors. This includes, you know, we're going to learn about IGOs, which are intergovernmental organizations, such as the UN or the World Trade Organization. INGOs, like international NGOs, non-governmental, multinationals, media, local government, NGOs, etc. And then a fun question might be, like, what is the, you know, do you know what's the oldest international organization in the world today? It's probably what? What? I give you extra credit if you know. <laughs> or just imagine, what's, what do you think is the oldest organization in the world today? International organization. Which church? Catholic church? Yes, Catholic church. Uh, since the you know, Rock of Peter, right? Woohoo, you get a point. Okay, yay. Mention that in your midterm review, okay? <laughs> that I, got a, I got the answer right. I wa I'm a great grubber. I want an A, okay. All right, now, the second thing is I want to talk about the governance and historical perspective, okay? Because the second key concept is global liberalism, right? Now, you can think in terms of three historical models. The first one is like modern states and international society. So in 1648, there was a huge war that ended, okay? This was like the, I think this was like a 30 years war. It was like a war of religion between Catholics and Protestants. Okay, and then after the war ended, people said, "Well, we want peace. That means that you know we we need to emphasize state sovereignty. That one ruler has ultimate authority within the territory's sovereign boundaries. Okay, because before that, you know, within within one country, you had all these religious divisions. Okay, it's basically like Iraq, all over again, right? Where you have all these different religions and they're fighting." to see who can gain control. And so, and you know, this led to devastation in places like Germany, you know, places like Germany, anywhere from like 20 to 50% of the people died, okay? So after the war ended, the, peop you know, the, the various governments decided that, okay, you know, for each country, the king, the sovereign, would decide what the religion would be. And if you don't like it, you just have to leave. So that way there'd be no war. Okay, so the Treaty of Westphalia, and it really emphasized state sovereignty. Okay, uh, and the, th the theory for this came from Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, and he argued that to preserve peace, the sovereign, which is the Leviathan, this powerful being, must control civil, military, judicial, and ecclesiastical powers. Does anyone know what this word means? Ooh. It's a big GRE word, TOEFL, TOEI. <laughs> okay, what does ecclesiastical mean? Come on, for those who are not good in English, I give you a point. Not you Swedish people, okay? Uh, ecclesiastical means like religious, okay? And so that for Thomas Hobbes, you, can, you cannot have like you cannot have division, you cannot have diversity. That's a bad thing. You need one government, one ruler, who has ultimate power to decide on all important things, and that includes religion, okay? So that's Thomas Hobbes, because he doesn't like war. He doesn't like what's happening in places like Iraq, okay? He wants a strong, centralized government. Uh, he wrote this in 1651, and later, Max Baver, uh, he had a more narrow definition of a state. He said, well, maybe government does not have to monopolize everything, but a government still has to monopolize one thing, which is what? You know, every functioning government to, be, to consider itself a government, a state, 
it needs to monopolize at least one thing. <coughs> maybe not religion, maybe not the economy, it doesn't have to be communist, but it has to monopolize what? To be a state. Come on! Guess something. You don't, you know, there's no, there's, you don't, you don't, you don't get penalized for being wrong. Okay? So what does a state have to monopolize? What, what? Violence. Okay, violence, right, the means of violence. Do you understand? So it doesn't have to control Walmart, but it needs to control the police, the army. Do you understand? It needs to monopolize the means of violence. Do you see? Uh, is anyone from like South Asia, like Pakistan, India, or nearby? Okay. Anyway, uh, what I I encourage everybody to kind of read the news to see what's going on, so you can make links to our class, right? So Max Weber says to have a functioning state, you need to monopolize the means of violence. Okay. So okay, let's go to this row. Does anyone read about what's happening in Pakistan right now, mm, or Iraq, or other places? Anyway, if you do read the news in Pakistan, there's been a lot of government protest. I mean, there was, there's been a lot of anti-government protests. Okay, and what happened was that a couple of days ago, I think like maybe like thousands of protesters, they got a bunch of sticks. Okay, and then they stormed the TV station, government TV station. Okay, I guess for those from England, it'd be like you know, the BBC, right? Or the Sweden would be like what the SBC? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but imagine, imagine uh, like imagine like ten thousand protesters coming to like KBS. Okay, and then they they enter, they and they kick out all the anchors and all the drama actors. Right? No, no more drama. Okay, so they so they kicked everybody out. They took all the food and they just you know they just. You know, they just monopolized that station for a few hours until the army came in. Okay. Uh, you know, if you have protesters that can like just, you know, enter TV stations all the time, is that a functioning state? Probably not, right? Because you know, they, because the people who worked there were scared. They thought they were going to get beat up or worse. Okay. So they all like ran away. And when that happens, that people like they don't want to invest in Pakistan because they think that the government doesn't have control. You have these crazy protesters that, ha you know, that goes around. And so you know, if the government wants to maintain control, it needs to monopolize the means of violence. Okay? That means it's OK for protesters to protest and demo, okay? but they cannot threaten other people with violence. Only the government should do that. Okay. And it, but if you have other non-governmental actors that can use violence, that means government no longer has a monopoly on the use of force. And that means that is no longer a fully functional state. It's a chaotic state. Okay. Okay, okay that's part one, what it means to be a state. And then another key, and then another key, something else that happened was the rise of the nation state. Okay? Uh, in the old days, you had many empires. You know what an em does anyone heard of empire? You you know you heard of empire right? Uh, when I think of empire, I always think like you know Empire Strikes Back, okay? You know like Star Wars right? And so empire is like a state that controls many different kinds of people, okay? Um, but then especially after the French Revolution, a lot of the empires fell because people no longer wanted to be governed by empire; they wanted to be governed by their own people, by their own nation. Do you understand? So, what's the historical example of an empire? This one? Yeah, maybe the Roman Empire, okay? Or more recently, you had the great like Japanese Empire, right? It controlled Taiwan, you know, Korea, a bunch of other places. But now, do we have like Japanese Empire? No. Now Japan's a nation state. Korea's a nation state. Taiwan's a nation state, okay? And so, um, and so, so you have the rise of not only like states but also nation states. Okay, um, and then so this system worked for a while and then it collapsed during World War One, right? And partly because um, 
you have states that wanted to act unilaterally, such as the USA. They imposed tariffs on other countries. And then you also had powers who wanted to be expansionist and revisionist. Basically, states that were not content to just you know, leave things the way they are, they want change. Okay? And so when states want change, that might lead to conflict. And so that led to huge wars, uh, World War I, World War II. And then since World War I, you had the rise of transnational political movements such as socialism and communism and fascism that did not want just one state, one nation state. They wanted like global, re they wanted like global change, global systems, global governments. Uh, and, that's, and this led to huge conflict in many countries, such as Russia, Spain, and even in Korea, right? So you had a huge Korean War. But it wasn't just a civil war, right? It was a war between who and who. So yeah, America and China, because you had you know, North and South, but then they represented different ideologies, right? Communism, you know, capitalism, so all these other nations got involved. So it wasn't just a civil war, it was a transnational war. And this was huge, you know, sort of from the, so from like the, ninth, so from the Spanish Civil War, you know, to the early, t you know, to the late 20th century, you had these huge wars between the left and right. Um, okay, but then huge wars also led to, you know, so transnational wars also led to more transnational organizations because, you know, people realize that it's no longer sufficient to just have a society of states. We need more formal intergovernmental organizations. Do you understand? So in the past, you had just a society, you had rulers of different governments different states, they got together, they make informal agreements. Uh, but then that system broke down, and so now we have more formal or bureaucratic organizations, such as the United Nations, with formal treaties. So you, you, know, you have the UN, NATO, and then you have the World Bank. And then the goals are, well the central goal of the United Nations is what? Did anyone read Article 1, Article 2? What is, a what is the central purpose of the UN? Yes? To war. Right, to avoid war. What's your name, sir? Huh? Your name, buddy? Emmons. Emmons? Clemens. Oh, Clemens. Clemens, where are you from? Austria. Austria, okay. So the central purpose is the collective security, right? And that's why the most important organ of the UN is the Security Council, you know, provide security. But uh, there's a question as to whether, well, you know, maybe the central purpose of international organizations is security, but how about other things, such as economics or politics, okay? So there's, so for the past 50 years, there was, a, there was this big debate uh, whether, you know, the United Nations, international bodies, should promote free markets or central planning, okay? That means central planning would be what? So instead of letting markets decide who becomes rich, who gets money, maybe we should have a, what? You know, maybe the government should decide. And maybe we need a, like a central body to distribute resources from you know, poor countries to rich countries. So that was a big debate in the 20th century. Another debate was about politics, okay? Human rights. Whether, you know, can governments do whatever they want or are there like international human rights norms? that you know that all governments have to adhere to and this was actually a debate for example in places like Syria right because what did Syria do anyone uh, you heard of okay let's try to get somebody new who heard of Syria okay one two three four you heard of Syria how about Korean people you never heard of Syria what do you do all day I don't know what they do all day. Okay. So in Syria, the government did what? Government did a bad thing, right? Which was what? They used... Chemical. Right, they used chemical weapons on their own people. Okay? And maybe like a hundred years ago, like it's okay because, you know, that's not my business. Okay? Every government can do what they want. Leviathan, right? But then in the modern era, there's something called human rights. And so that means that you know, if you 
used chemical weapons, that means you're violating like international treaties. That means that external bodies, have a, they may have a right to intervene. So there was a real debate, for example, in the United States, whether we should bomb Syria or whether we should intervene in some way. Oh, yes? Be true, but right, right, right. Well, there, well, that's a secondary issue because you know, like, like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So maybe like ISIS is bad. Maybe we should support Assad. At the same time, in terms of the issue of chemical weapons, I think the UN, uh, NATO was very clear. Chemical weapons is bad. Any country that uses chemical weapons are subject to like very heavy, san- ep- like either economic sanctions or military sanctions. And so, so, th- so my general point is that you know, governments cannot do what- whatever they want. There's this growing debate whether we should have imposed international rules based on liberalism and human rights. So the point is that we're having both an economic debate and a political debate. What kind of world we want, okay? And then one claim is that, especially after 1989, there's a you know, some people claim that we should make the whole world a liberal, democratic, international order. Okay, like a cosmopolitan democracy. Uh, this, so, one argument for this came from uh, Francis Fukuyama. Has anyone heard of Francis Fukuyama, End of History? Okay, so you heard of it, right? And so, what was his central claim? His central claim was that what happened in 1989? In 1989, you had, you know, Something fell down, right? What fell down? What? Your hat fell down. Something fell down, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, the Berlin Wall. Okay. So imagine, like, you know, imagine, like, what's a what's a big wall that we have in Korea? Yeah, DMZ, right? So imagine DMZ fell down. That'd be a big event, right? In Korean history, right? And so, you know, that's what happened in Germany, 1989. And so Francis Fukuyama wrote an article that says, you know, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, it also means the collapse of any, any, any challenge to liberalism. That today, the only major ideology that really works is liberalism political and economic liberalism, free markets, democracy, that everything else does not re- cannot really challenge that liberal, hege- that liberal hegemonic ideal. Do you understand the idea? Okay. So the idea is that you know, maybe, maybe it's going to take you know, many years, but ultimately at the end, everybody wants to live in a what? In a you know, liberal democracy. Okay? And so both national governments, and the global system needs to represent the liberal idea. So this is a very powerful claim. And the idea is that sovereignty, you know, the state government power is ultimately vested upon the people, not a king, okay? So that authority ultimately comes from the people. And it's a people who delegate it to different government institutions. Okay? So if the people decide that, you know, hey, maybe like right now, you know, Koreans, where do you live? This is a simple question, very easy. Korean, okay, 한국 사람, okay? Where do you live? 지금 어디 살아? Where do you live? Right, which is part of what country? Yes, what country are you from? You live in Korea. Okay, come on, simple, right? All right, so, you know, so, what's your name? Hangyeol. What's your last name, Lee? Okay, Mr. Lee. 
I was gonna say camp, but anyway. All right. Uh, so Mr. Lee lives in Wangshimli, right? Which is part of Seoul, which is part of Korea. Okay. And then, and then you as a you know, and then right now you decided that well I want to live in a country called you know Republic of Korea. Okay. But maybe in the future you might decide maybe I don't want to live in South Korea. And maybe I don't want this place to be called South Korea. Maybe I want this place to be called what? I don't know, like maybe just East Asia. Do you understand? Or you know, maybe East Asia or Greater Asia or something. Okay? But the point is that if Francis Fukuyama is true, and if everybody is an equal individual human being, then you can Make, you can make anything that, you know, the, the people together can decide. The people can, together can, you know, they can decide, you know, what, you know, the kind of national or international order they want to belong to. Do you understand? So, I guess, you know, a good example might be like, you know, like Sweden, right? You know, Sweden, Europe, right? Because in the old days, you know, I guess like, you know, Europeans were always like fighting against each other, and I don't know. Swedish people, do you love everybody or? <laughs> okay, so you look like, okay. Maybe except for Sweden, okay? Don't you like? Don't you hate Finland or something? Okay, okay, Norway, okay, Norway. All right. So there's always like rivals, right? So like you know, like France, Germany, France, UK, you know, Sweden, Norway. Okay, but then in the past 50 years, what happened in Europe? All those like you know, all those national divisions have what? Have what? Right. So all those many of those national divisions has fallen away. Okay? And so, you know, so these days, you know, like Sweden and Norway, like they don't like fight. Maybe like boxing. I don't know if you guys box. Okay? Maybe in, okay, maybe just football, right? So the only national like you know, the only national like division is like sports. But on the really important matters such as war, you know, economics, there's really no conflict. It's, you know, EU believes in like democracy, freedom, free markets. So, and because like they imagine this, right? So after World War II, people said, why do we always have to live as a separate nation state? How come we cannot imagine something bigger and better? So they imagine Europe. Okay. And so this is kind of like, it's almost like a liberal dream. And you can imagine this maybe like in your country, in your region, right? So why does Asia have to be so divided? Maybe we can form like a United Asia, or United Latin America, or United Africa, or United North America. Do you see? And so if authority, if authority ultimately comes from the people, then the people can decide you know, how they want the world to change. Okay, so is that a, you know, do you think that's a good dream? No, she hates Europe. Okay, how come it's not a good dream to be united? What's your name? Okay, Miss Park. How come you don't like, you know, how, go on. What do you want to say? Anything you want, but the point is that if po if authority ultimately comes from the people, then the people can change the current state system, just like what they did in Europe. Okay, so in Europe, you can go anywhere you want in the European Union. You don't need a passport. Well, within the you know within the European Union, right? You can go anywhere. You can work anywhere. You can live anywhere. So imagine you, Miss Park. Imagine a united, like imagine an Asian union, right? That means you can live and work anywhere in Asia. No passport. Before you have reality, 
you need a vision, right? You need a certain ideal. And so, you know, so before you have politics, you need philosophy, right? Like this ideal that you want to push for. Is this something that you want to spend the rest of your life pushing for? You know, to have like a, you know, Asian Union. This is something that the statesmen of Europe pushed for. They, they spent their, devoted their whole lives to making this European Union happen. Okay? And now it's, you know, and, uh, and, and it, and it, and it kind of, you know, more or less it kinda, it's kind of working out, right? There's been no major war within Europe for the past, like, you know, 60 years, which is a huge accomplishment. And so the question is, is this something that you want? Is this something that you want to devote your life to? You know, to creating like a united Asia, okay? If so, then that means that, you know, you need to make all Asians very liberal. You know, you understand? You need to push them to support like individual rights, human rights, democracy. That means you need to promote liberalism to all the countries out there that are not liberal. Such as what? What countries are not that liberal? Yeah, China, big country, right? But if you can liberalize China, if you can liberalize like Vietnam and Thailand, all those other places, then you can make them like Europe. We can be all united. Because now, instead of being like Thai or Chinese or Japanese, our fundamental identity is as you know, human beings, as liberal, as liberal citizens. That liberal citizenship you know, my identity as a human being is more important than my nationality. You understand? But my point is that maybe not everybody agrees, but this is a very powerful idea that came, that, that really became very strong after 1989 and is spreading. And so it's like, it's, an, it's, like it's a potential vision for the world. Let's make, let's liberalize the whole world. Let's all be like Europe or, or like North America. Okay, where everybody is considered an equal individual citizens. Okay, so think about if that's something that you want. Okay. Anyway, those you know the idea of liberalism actually sounds like a very good idea, but there's all these challenges and problems, right? Well, there's challenges and opportunities. Uh, one is that you know there are a lot of not there, we still have a lot of non-liberal powers such as Russia, China, and there's a real question as to whether these you know, powerful governments, powerful states, whether they're gonna go in a liberal direction or in a, long, or in a non-liberal direction, okay? And probably the most important non-liberal state today is what? Yes, yes, China. China is the most important non-liberal state left. There is Russia, but eh. You know, I think I think they might bully Ukraine, but they don't have a lot of power, like you know, globally. Okay, China has a lot of global power, and so it's very important if you believe in a liberal international order to liberalize China. Okay, and so for Friday, I want you to read. I'm not, I email this to you, John Ickenberry, the rise of China and the future of the West. Okay, and two. There was a really fun New York Times article about a game of shark and minnows, okay? Is anyone from Southeast Asia or the Philippines or Taiwan? Okay, ah, we need more diversity. Anyway, so um, what's happening is that China is like basically taking more and more territory in Southeast Asia because they said like, look, maybe like a long time ago, China was number one, okay? And then, you know, and then we used to be great, and then we, you know, we went down, right? Now we want to be great again. And so they're pushing kind of other countries away. But, so this is causing a lot of tension. And, a lot of, and so these countries are saying, like, instead of following, like, international law, international rules, China is just doing what they want, okay? It's basically, like, you know, it's basically like you know, realism that you know, powerful states do what they want and the weak states just have to submit. And so there's a real question as to like, whether China is going to liberalize or it's going to go in a very non-liberal direction, non -liberal direction. Okay? So that's challenge number one. Uh, challenge number two is that 
you know, citizens of liberal democracies themselves are often reluctant to respect equal rights of foreigners. Okay. So, for example, like, you know, I think who who comes from liberal democracies? Okay, one, two, three. What all of you are the rest of you are communists? <laughs> Bad. They must be Chinese spies. Okay, but you guys are from liberal democracies. You believe in like individual rights. Do you consider Korea to be a democracy? Yes or no? Korea democracy? Yes or no? Yes. Woohoo! Okay. And, and you believe in and Koreans believe in liberal human rights. Human rights, good or bad? She's thinking about it. <laughs> Maybe I don't like human rights. I love Kim Jong Il. Okay. So human rights, good or bad? Good. Okay. So I think if you ask most people in Korea, they say you know democracy good, human rights good. Okay. Unless they unless they're from unless they carry Ebola. Okay. You know that might be the exception. So there was a we had this really fun controversy. <laughs> So anyway, so there's a lot of nerdy people out there who love Math Olympics. I don't know who. Is that you? Okay, you can be honest later and say like, "Ooh, I love math, Professor E." Anyway, uh, so so you know, a lot of Koreans are pretty nerdy. They love math, <laughs> and then like they you know they wear big glasses. But maybe they're wearing contacts now, so you can't tell. But um, so this year, we're sponsoring the Global Math Olympics, right? Woohoo! So exciting. And where is it going to be held? It's going to be held in Seoul, right? Uh, actually, it was sometime this week. Uh, but then what happened? You know, they decided to basically what? Does anyone remember? This was, come on, don't you read Korean newspapers? Uh, they don't read. Anyway. So they basically kicked out all the delegates from Africa. They said, you cannot come. You know, we don't care about Europe. Because, uh, let me see now. Actually, from all the, e all the countries where the Ebola virus happened, and also surrounding countries. But there's actually some Koreans who say, we should just kick out all Africans. <laughs> and so this was the next article. <laughs> Let's read this together. Okay, all right. So anyway, so Tuksan Women's University is a very prestigious women's university, and they want to sponsor a conference to empower women. Who wants to empower women? Okay, yay! A couple of people. Everybody else hates women. Don't empower them. Okay, but there's people like you who wants to empower women, right? And then let's read this together. Uh, I need a volunteer to read this for me. I give you extra credit. Okay, come up here. Because, you know, they need to see your pretty face. <laughs> All right, but you get extra points. Okay. All right. Not the whole thing. Just one par just a couple of paragraphs. Come here. You need the camera needs to see your oh pretty my face. Say hi. <laughs> If, if the university don't like us, uh -huh. they're not gonna they're not gonna show it they're not gonna show it <laughs> anyway. Okay, so <laughs> they, they only it's only gonna be OCW if, if if it's really good and we're all very handsome. Okay. All right. So right now yeah, we'll see. Okay. You're very handsome. I don't know about me. I'm handsome. <laughs> Great. Okay. Right. What's your name? Yuna. Where are you from? Um, I'm Korean. Okay, good for you. Yeah. All right. Can you read the first paragraph? Sure. Sure. Tuxung Women's University, a host of the 2014 World Congress to be held in Seoul, came under fire yesterday after it was reported that participants from Nigeria, one of the affected nations, and 10 other African countries were anticipated to take part in the event. One more, one more. The World Congress of Global Partnership for Young Women 2014 centers. Say what? Whatever is more easy for you. Uh, this one's easier. Centers on the empowerment of women. A total of 500 people from 32 countries will be present. In face of heavy criticism expressed by its students and the public over the potential spread of Ebola, the university announced yesterday that it has rescinded its invitation to the Nigerian participants. 
However, it was not enough to cool down intensifying frustration from, uh, from critics who demanded the entire Congress to be called off. Some of the women's university students and other opponents argue that other African participants from countries like Ghana or Rwanda may have come in contact with the disease. The students yesterday initiated an online petition to cancel the event, garnering support from more than 15,000 people. Thanks, so 15,000 people signed an online petition to like, either cancel it or kick out everybody from Africa. Thank you. Okay. I need volunteer number two. Come on, you get extra points, and you know who knows, you might be a star someday. Okay, you want to go, or you want to go? Everybody has to participate sooner or later. Come on up. Okay, it's okay. You're taking this class of practice English, right? All right, come on. I help you with the English. Okay. All right. What's your name? Oh, nice to meet you. All right. Say hi <laughs> to the camera. Okay. Hanji, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Suwon. Oh, Suwon. Yeah. Okay. It's a nice city. Okay. All right. Can you read this? Doksang's official blog. Hanji, my name. Doksang. Doksang's official blog and website as well as the bulletin board on the Blue House's website were bombarded with a flood of posts condemning uh, the schools hosting the, of the event. Okay. <laughs> so blah, blah, blah. Can you just read the school? The school also said it uh, would have particip participants mm -hmm. Uh, stay in the separate building away from the school's dormitory. Uh, reversing? Dormitory. Mm -hmm. uh, reversing its initial plan to accommodate them in the dorms. Right. You understand? So, Usan, originally, all the, you know, all the women participants, they were going to stay in the dorms. Okay, Kizuksa maybe with other students, right? So they can build, you know, women's solidarity, okay? But the women's students said what? No, we don't want to live with you. You might be like, Ugh, you know, dirty, right? Or like disease. So because the women students complain, all the, all the foreign participants have to, you know, stay in a different building, okay? Okay, um, and this, this whole, you know, this whole controversy started when a student uploaded a post on an online student community website, okay? At the same time, not all Koreans are like anti-foreigner. There was actually a, there was actually a, you know, Korean group, a missionary group that wanted to go to Africa, okay? Can I get one more volunteer to read, a, to, to, to read about those nice missionaries? Anybody? You wanna volunteer? No, okay. Do you want to volunteer? Okay, come on up. Yay. She's going to get an A. I don't know about <laughs> you guys. <laughs> All right. Somewhere? Last week. Okay. Oh, by the way, say hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> What's your name? Emily. Emily, where are you yeah. from? Sweet. Oh, welcome to Korea. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's read this. Last week. Okay. Uh, last week, a medical missionary organization also faced a wave of criticism after it reported that it planned to visit Africa for volunteer work. The organization, got, uh, Good News, <laughs> God, uh, Good News Medical Volunteers, posted its itinerary, itinerary, itinerary this week, which included Ghana, Ivory Coast, and Tanzania. Following hi following heightened concerns, the organizations. No, no, the organization, which is affiliated with a mission, withdrew its plans. About 70 nurses, doctors, and volunteers from the group were scheduled to fly to those regions last Friday. We decided to cancel all the schedule for volunteer service in the wake of the e Ebola outbreak. Uh, Good News Medical Volunteers said in a statement, every summer we dispatch medical professionals in Africa and the Middle East. But this year it seems that it will be hard to carry out medical service. We feel deep regret for what has happened in those uh, West African countries. Stop. Okay, thank you, Emily. Okay. So what happened? 
Um, did you guys hear about this in the news? You heard about it, right? You also heard about it? Okay. So, well, everybody heard about Ebola, right? But probably this is the first time they heard about the local reaction here in Korea. So, I think, in a, I, in a way, I, you know, this article was kind of interesting because it kind of showed like different reactions. On the one hand, there was a lot of, like, there's a huge like public reaction against like Ebola. There's a real public fear that, you know, that the outside world is bad and we don't want anybody from these bad places coming to Korea, infecting our pure homeland, right? Making it total walk dirty. Um, do you know anybody who felt that way? You know, like, so there are all these people, there was a student who started this posting, right? So like, you know, imagine like how that student, imagine what that student was thinking. Was that you? Who posted? <laughs> So it was one of the Korean students who posted, okay? At the, on the other hand, you also had like people like medical missionaries who wanted to go to Africa. You know, they wanted to serve. They didn't you know, they wanted to be with them, okay? But one, but you know, when the, but when other Koreans found out that these medical missionaries were gonna go to Africa, they started complaining. And do you remember what the Koreans said? They said, if the medical missionaries go to Africa, we should what? That, you know, we shouldn't, we should not let them return. Did you hear about that? Right, so anyway, so, so you had all these people posting on these online communities that if those medical missionaries go to Africa, they should stay, you know, they, we should not let them come back. So there was a lot of criticism. And so, you know, because of this public pressure, the missionaries had to cancel their trip, okay? And they felt really bad. Um, so, you know, what, so, you know, what's your response to this? Is this like, you know, those, like those Korean students at Tokusong Yeoja Deakyo, do they represent minority view or kind of like a majority view, okay? I mean, like, are you afraid of like people from Africa because of Ebola, or do you love Africa? You want, you know, you want to, you know, you want to be a medical missionary too, okay? You're like nodding your head. So, you love Africa or you don't like Africa? What's your name? Oh, no, okay. Can you come up? Hola, oh, Okay. Okay, come on up. The price is right. Okay. It's an old shell. Okay. What's your name? My name is Nakuki. Okay. Welcome. Say hello. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Korea. Okay. And then, what do you think about this controversy? Are you like happy, sad, proud? <coughs> okay. Do you think like, you know, like, so there's a huge Ebola crisis in Africa. Yes. What should Korea do? What, what, what should Koreans do? How should Koreans respond? Oh, I think we don't have to show <coughs> the, the hostiles to to the disease. Okay. But not the people, I think. Okay. So, uh, personally, I. I love Africa. Okay. I always want to go there. Okay. But uh, this is, uh, but this is a different problem. You know, uh, it it can threaten our people's lives. Okay. Now, so right now we have a big women's conference at Tokyo Yoja Deokyo, right? A lot of people want to go. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, we we want to go. Do you think we should let African people go? If they don't have this. Check them for disease. Should we invite them to come, or should we just say, if you come from those bad countries, if you come from those countries, nobody should come. Do you understand? Yeah. So, like you know, Nigeria, there's only like maybe there were like maybe, I think maybe like let's say three, maybe like Nigeria is a huge country, you know, over 50 million people, maybe just three or four people are sick. Okay. Does that mean we should ban all Nigerians from coming? 
or should we maybe just or should we let them come as long as we check them at the airport? I think the second should be right. Okay, second option me. is better. Yeah. Okay. So there should be uh, the complete control of the uh, guests from other countries. Okay. So under that condition, mm -hmm. be Okay. So Mr. Kim says as long as we, you know, as long as we do a, do a medical checkup, people from Africa should come to Korea. That's number one, right? And do you think that you know the medical missionaries they wanted to go to Africa to help the Africans, right? Do you think that's a good idea to send missionaries or you know people to Africa, or do you think we should wait until Ebola crisis is over before sending the Koreans there? Do you understand? Yes. I yeah. Do we should we go when there's a crisis or wait until the crisis is over? Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm not a Christian, but. Uh, I always have a, a nice um, impression of the the foreign missionary programs, like uh, like in the in the article, or there's a, there's plenty of programs that uh, uh, the, the many Christians go uh, to other countries with good means. Uh, but <coughs> uh, but when I read this article, it's it's like it's uh, sending sending the people from our country to. African countries to cure or, or cure a disease is, is a bit much, I think. It's too much of a risk? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Why? Because, mm. because, they might get, because they might get sick and die? Yeah, that, that's, that can be one, uh, one possibility. Okay. And, and uh, these Ebola things are, uh, I, I, uh, as long as I know it's, it's very hard to cure or, or it, it doesn't have even a uh, cure. Whereas a 50, as a, I think it's like 30 to 90 percent fatality rate. Yes. Anyway, yes. so the fatality rate is very high. There's no cure. Okay. So oh, so once once a once a person get it, it, it just goes next day. Right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> not necessarily, but let's just say let's just say 50 percent. Okay. Okay. You have a 50 percent of dying. Okay. And and uh, my point is that this is very high high chance to uh, die. Right. Right. That means we should let them die, or do you want to help them? No, uh, uh, what I'm saying is there's, there's too much risk for us to send people to uh, other countries just to care. Because uh, it's very high chance to, it has very high chance to die. And we, we, we can, we, I think we can do... Uh, other things? Yes, uh, first, we, we can do nothing about the, the, the patients. Okay, but what if you have volunteers from Korea? Come on up. No, no okay. <laughs> and, uh, you can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Yay. Okay. All right. What's your name? Samira. Samira. Okay. You cannot see Samira, but she's very nice. <laughs> okay. All right. What, and what do you want to say? Uh, what I mean is, like, if the Ebola was in Korea, wouldn't you like, like, help from other countries? like we have to help each other every time even though it's like risky we have to go even though it's like you might die we have to like help each other all the I time have to help each other. this is actually an interesting debate uh, I think in Europe there was a like there was a sim there was some not exactly similar but there was a related crisis like during World War II many Jews wanted to escape Europe they wanted to go to you know other countries right you know to for freedom to live but many countries said, no, you know, we don't, want, you don't, we don't want your problem. So they closed the borders. So many Jews died. On the other hand, other countries, they opened their borders. Do you see? Because they wanted to give them, you know, they wanted to give them life. 
And so you have to think about, you know, like, what if the same thing happened in Korea, right? Um, well, what, what did happen in Korea was that we had the Korean War, right? We had like communist, you know, when North Korea, they invaded South Korea. And South Korea, they asked other countries for help. And other countries, what? You know, they helped. They sent many troops here, do you see? And then, you know, so I, th so I think more than like 40, 50 countries, they sent troops to defend South Korea from North Korea and China. And then after the war, they gave you know a lot of money, you know, to rebuild South Korea. Do you remember that? So I remember like, you know, like your parents' generation, they love spam, right? Do you remember? Okay, maybe your grandparents' generation. I'm getting old, but have you heard of spam? You heard of spam? Woohoo! Oh, okay. Like, what is the strange <laughs> thing? Spam is like a lunch meat. Okay, and it's be, it was very popular in Korea uh, for much of the 20th century because spam was brought by American soldiers during the Korean War, and you know in the old days Koreans meat was very expensive, right? So for them spam was like woohoo, like it's meat, it's in a can, you know we can eat it anytime we want. So it became like this like great like national delicacy. But the point is that you know spam came to Korea because you know other countries came to Korea, and they helped Korea. They brought all these like, they brought a lot of money, construction materials, and food like spam, and that's why like you have so many beautiful Korean men and women today, because they ate all that protein. Now they're big and strong. So don't make fun of spam. It made your parents strong, okay, and you know tall, all that protein. Anyway, so do you, do you see Samira's point, right? That, you know, maybe like Korea is like, you know, rich and strong today, but Korea wasn't always rich, right? You know, it was poor and it was in crisis, like, you know, 50, not, you know, 50 years ago. And maybe 50 years from now, there might be another crisis. Who knows, right? And so, you know, all countries have to like help each other. Anyway, that's Samira's point. Uh, but then why is it that many Koreans do not want to help Africa? Why? Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't feel any like solidarity. Maybe they think that yes, I believe in like human rights and equality, but maybe that's only for like philo maybe that's just philosophy. It's not really like practical. So I think that's a second challenge that a lot of like you know people who who believe in human rights is hard. You know they don't really act on it. And you know. And the few people who do act on it, you know, you know, they need additional motivations, such as like religion. So like the very few Koreans who are willing to go to places like Africa are people like you know medical missionaries because they feel like not only do we believe in human rights, but we also believe in you know God, and God tells me I should go to Africa, and so I follow. Okay, so you know that's something to think about. Okay, so medical missionaries and other organizations create global ties and solidarity. Okay, next part is stretch.